This is a production of Cornell University. Welcome uh, to all of you, and uh, particularly welcome to uh, General Tony Zinni to uh, Cornell. Uh, last year, General Zinni was named a Frank Rhodes Class of 1956 professor at Cornell. This professorship is in honor of Cornell's ninth president, uh, uh, Frank Rhodes, who served between, as president between 1977 uh, and 1995. The purpose of the professorship is to strengthen the undergraduate experience by bringing to the university individuals from every walk of life who represent excellence of achievement, um, as well as to create opportunities for interaction with the undergraduate community. Uh, this week is, is the first uh, campus visit of uh, General Zinni as the uh, Rhodes Professor, uh, and uh, we, we uh, look very much forward to welcoming him back in the next couple years. Tonight he speaks uh, here as part of the Ainaudi Center's uh, Foreign Policy Distinguished Speaker Series. Um, this series is part of the, of the Ainaudi Center's um, Foreign Policy Initiative, uh, which is our attempt to really uh, bring uh, t uh, people to campus and uh, forge a, a much more um, uh, profound discussion of foreign policy issues on, on the campus community. Uh, we're very grateful for the support uh, received uh, for this initiative from the Ainaudi family uh, and from the uh, Kessler family. Uh, let, me, let me, before introducing our speaker today, let me say that uh, the theme uh, for this spring and for next fall is the future of American foreign policy uh, uh, in the context of uh, this um, a presidential year. Uh, next week, let me uh, recommend uh, you all to our, our speaker, Frank uh, Fukuyama, who will come here from uh, the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and will talk specifically on uh, the future of American foreign policy. In the early fall, uh, Stephen Krasner, who worked at the State Department uh, and has recently returned to Stanford, will, will speak on September 17. And in November, Nancy Birdsall of the um, Center for Global Development in Washington will talk about foreign aid and the developing world again in the context of this election. Okay, for tonight. Um, General Zinni is one of the most respected and outspoken American military leaders with exceptional international experience uh, uh, and a, a, a careful analyst of, uh, of, of world politics. Uh, he retired in, from the military in 2000 after commanding the U.S. Central Command, and during his 40-plus year of military service, he received 23 personal military awards uh, and holds 37 unit service and campaign awards. He's also received uh, a number of civilian awards, and his military service took him to 70 countries uh, inclu in Africa, Asia, Europe, the Caribbean, and the Pacific. He was involved in the planning and execution of Operation Proven Force and Operation Patriot Defender in support of the Gulf War and uh, uh, of non-combatant evacuation operations. He's also participated in presidential diplomatic missions to Somalia, Pakistan, uh, and Ethiopia, uh, as well as State Department missions involving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and conflicts in Indonesia and the Philippines. General Zinni holds a bachelor's degree in economics from Villanova University and a master's degree in international relations from Salve Regina College, a master's degree finally in business from Central Michigan University and three honorary doctorates. He's held several academic positions and has been a member of, of several university boards and he lectures frequently at colleges and universities in the US and abroad. Um, please join me in welcoming General Zinni to Cornell. Thank you. Thank you very much. The subject of uh, my talk this evening is the New World Order. And I want to take you back to about 1989. I was, uh, at that time, selected uh, to be a Brigadier General and told that uh, my new assignment would be in the European Command as the Deputy Director of Operations. 
I was to attend our uh, capstone course where our newly promoted uh, one-star general and admirals go through uh, a, a course of training and a trip to the area they're going to be assigned. Now, if you remember back 19, the end of 1989 to beginning of 1990, marked the fall of the Soviet Union when basically Gorbachev threw in the towel. We arrived, several of us newly promoted one-stars, in Europe and went immediately to Berlin. We were to be briefed by the Berlin Brigade, an army brigade stationed in Berlin that was always thought of as the front lines of freedom. When we arrived, uh, it seemed like chaos. No one seemed to know what was happening. The Soviet Union had just imploded, not even really imploded. That, that, that maybe uh, implies too much uh, energy. It just sort of fizzled. And the Berlin Brigade, the officers that were supposed to brief us at the time, didn't know what to tell us because they were trying to still sort out what had happened. I'm sure they had the same briefs that for the last 30 years they'd been given to capstone classes that came. And now these briefs were meaningless. They were unsure how to humor us for the day or two that we were there, so they assigned a, a young second lieutenant, Army second lieutenant, to sort of escort us around. The Army second lieutenant asked us if we would like to go into East Berlin. And we asked him if we could do this. Was this permissible? Were we allowed to go? And he said, no one knows. Nobody knows the rules. And he said, let's go, see what happens. And he had a, this Volkswagen van that looked like a reject from a 60s hippie uh, uh, convention. We piled into his Volkswagen van, and we drove through Checkpoint Charlie. Now, in the 40 years before that, and probably back to the beginnings of my memory, Checkpoint Charlie was truly the forward outpost of freedom the point at which we f confronted the, uh, the evil empire, as uh, President Reagan described it. We drove through Checkpoint Charlie and nobody was there. We drove to the other side, drove down the main street of Berlin, and it was clear that this was a Potemkin village. It was a facade, the main street. As soon as you turned off, you saw these uh, pockmarked buildings with the bullet holes still there from World War II. You saw the people driving around in 50s vintage bicycles and these German, East German produced cars, these trobbies, belching gas, all looking the same and kind of decrepit. Now we had just come from West Berlin where we had seen Audis, Mercedes, BMWs, so this was like a, a time warp into the early 50s or something. We drove around for a while and the lieutenant spotted a Russian military garrison and he said, let's go in here. We turned the vehicle through the gate and the Russian sentries didn't know whether to shoot or salute us as we came through. And we barreled through, got out of the van, walked around to their officers club and uh, for a while in their commissary and around the, the, their concern there and watched the Russian soldiers and their dependents. And I got to tell you, what struck me is they seemed like zombies. They seemed to be going through the motion but totally unaware of what was happening around them. They seemed almost numb to events. And as I later realized, they weren't unsure of their future. There wasn't a place to go back to in Russia. Uh, the, the military housing wasn't available. And they were more confused probably than we were as to what happened in the events there. When we came back through Checkpoint Charlie, the lieutenant managed to reach under his seat and pull out a sledgehammer. And he said, let's take down the wall. So now, and I swear we must have been the first ones to do this, but now you had about five one-star generals and admirals, the United States military, banging on a wall with little effect other than a few chips we saved as very valuable souvenirs. We came through Checkpoint Charlie, and later that day we went on to our next set of briefings at the U.S. Army Europe headquarters in Heidelberg. And after we had uh, in our helicopter flown down to where we picked up a minibus and drove down, I was staring out the window watching the German scenery go by and I was thinking about what I had just experienced. Because as I said, all my life this was the evil empire. This is, uh, you know, the doomsday clock was up there around five minutes to twelve. And uh, my whole life, certainly in the military, and I joined when I was eighteen, had been focused around preventing and deterring and containing or, God forbid, fighting a Soviet Union. And all of a sudden this big, gigantic threat 
disappeared. I had a strange thought as we were barreling down the Audubon. I was thinking about Mrs. Harris's first grade class, 1949. I had to take a pillowcase to, to class. I don't know why I remembered it. Uh, the pillowcase was so when the air raid siren sounded off, we pulled the pillowcases over our heads and dove under the desk, or Mrs. Harris led us down to the civil defense shelter in the basement of our school, our elementary school. And that thought about what I had experienced in the earliest memories I had and where I was now, 40 years later, it told me something has happened here, something big. I got to my next command in Stuttgart, Germany, in the European command, and we were anxious to understand what this all meant. President Bush, at the time, President Bush 41, was giving his speech about a new world order and the peace dividend, if you recall, if you're old enough to recall. And we thought, well, this is going to be a wonderful time in, in our history. I had a sense that everyone felt the world was going to sort of self-order in a positive way. A big sigh of relief was going to be breathed because we no longer faced this, this uh, Armageddon that, that kind of loomed because of uh, the ability for each side to destroy our species. And we all waited for this peace dividend, which never came. In my time at the European Command, we went through all sorts of operations in the Balkans, in Africa, the Gulf War in the Middle East, and instead of a peace dividend, it seemed like the world was coming apart like a cheap suitcase. Our military commitments to peacekeeping missions, humanitarian missions, combat missions, just seemed to come one after another. In the years I spent at the European Command following that, our battle staff and crisis action team was in being the entire time, which was unusual. It was unheard of before that to ha have that happen. The number of UN missions and operations, US military-led coalition operations just seemed to, to be never-ending and come one at a time. There was not a peace dividend, far from it. Our military was shrinking, sure enough, and we were watching the size of the forces come down, and people were trying to understand what kind of military we would need in this new world. And there was the beginnings of talk of transforming the military and some sort of transformation, but basically it was just the shrinkage of a military that now was becoming more and more overcommitted, well before 9-11. I got back from this tour of duty with a sense when I returned to the United States that I'm not sure we understand exactly what's happening here. There was an attempt by Secretary of State Baker to begin a, a, what, what was termed a, a Marshall Plan for the republics of the former Soviet Union. I was involved with Ambassador Rich Armitage, who headed it up. And we attempted to sort of mobilize Europeans and others to connect to this former Soviet Union. We did it with NATO generals to the military, but on an economic basis and a political basis uh, to begin to sort of ensure that this new world order that the Soviets were entering was one that was stable, where we connected them with them in a way that they understood how to operate now in a democracy, in a free market economy, little efforts that were, you know, to, to teach uh, international auditing standards and, and all sorts of other projects that were embodied in this. It wasn't successful. There wasn't much interest, frankly, and, and it died of its sort of its, its own weight. When I got back from the United States, I had to buy a car, and I went to the car dealership that I bought my last six or seven cars. Old Bob was a retired gunnery sergeant, United States Marine Corps, and I bought my cars from him as far back as I could remember. The problem when I went to Bob's car dealership is it wasn't a Chevy dealership anymore. I always bought Chevys. Bob had a Honda dealership. I said to Bob, you communist. How can you be selling Hondas, you know? And he handed me a certificate that showed me that the Hondas on his lot were made in Merrifield, Ohio. He said, go down to the Chevy dealership and see where they're made. And I did. The Chevy dealership shows me a certificate that they're assembled in Mexico. I said, what happened in the years I was gone? You know, gone. What, what occurred? Well, of course, you're seeing the beginnings of globalization. And the forces of globalization have had, in some cases, arguably positive effects, in some cases, negative effects. But it seemed like the collapse of the Soviet Union 
sort of triggered now this international movement, not only in, in, in terms of international multinational corporations and business and, and in an economic sense, but in many other areas. I also felt that now we were beginning to see more cooperation, but cooperation not necessarily in a positive way. We were beginning to see the rise of movements and non-state entities that we had never seen before. Some of these non-state entities I had run into in some of the operations we conducted, non-governmental organizations doing God's work on the ground, reconstructing societies, not really uh, identified by any, any particular national identity, non-state entities that we met that were not so good, called warlords, extremist groups, uh, uh, drug cartels. And so now we saw a beginning of a new dynamic Entities and that, that could influence things one way or another that did not have capitals and borders or own terrain. They were borderless. They were movements. They were ideologies. Uh, they were organized internationally to accomplish something, good, bad, or, or indifferent. We have seen since then, obviously, the rise of the information age. We have seen the rise uh, 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 of, of information technology that has changed the world. We worry now about a six foot seven Arab living in a cave, maybe somewhere in Pakistan, that runs a worldwide network on throwaway cell phones and the internet that confounds us in our ability to counter him fully, defeat him or find him in some way. The rise of technology has confounded certainly my generation. You know, I, I was in the airport coming up here on Sunday I was in uh, Richmond, Virginia, where I caught the plane to, to come here. I'm sitting in the, at the gate, and I'm watching around me people on laptops, Blackberries, and cell phones. In one position, I saw a man with a, a laptop, a cell phone, and a Blackberry, and a landline he had somehow gotten a hold of, and he was doing business. I have, I have friends in the business world that do not have an office, do not have any structure. They only own these sorts of things and they make billion dollar deals. I watch the instructions as they pack up, get on the airplane, and they're told by the flight attendant what they can't use now and what they can use, which I can't follow. I mean, it, it's just beyond my, my understanding. And then when we land at Ithaca Airport, they're now told what they can turn on and what they have to turn off. Everybody picks up a cell phone and calls somebody. I don't know who the hell they're talking to and how many people care that that flight landed at Ithaca. I got to admit, I reach into my pocket for my cell phone that I never turn on and pretend like I'm talking to somebody <laughs> because I don't want to feel left out or I'm not part of the crowd that really is cool enough and understands how to use this. But it is amazing. I mean, I, this is my eighth chair at a university. I also teach at, at Duke. And in my, with my students, when they sit down, they pop their laptops open. I don't look at faces, I look at the backs of laptops. I don't know if they're downloading music or taking notes on my class. But this has certainly changed the world in the way we do business now. It is the ability to communicate, the ability to connect, the information technology and the access to other technologies certainly has added to the changes in the world in the last two decades. Another factor of change have been the diasporas and the migrations. To sort of paraphrase the Southwest Airlines ad, you are now free to move about the world. It was almost as if the collapse of the Soviet Union invited everybody to reposition somewhere. You know, we, we know the issues of, of undocumented or illegal or however we phrase it, of, of the migration south to north here, migrations in, in, in Europe and elsewhere, but there are massive movements it's changed the nature and identity of our societies. In many ways, I feel for the good. Uh, I, when I, I teach this leadership class at Duke and I talk about 21st century leadership, you lead a much more diverse group of people, no matter what you do in the world. I could look outside my office and the business I have, down the corridor, and look at about 20 people, and they are from all over the United States or from all over the world, originally, in some way or fashion. They are people of color. They are people of different ethnic backgrounds. It adds a richness to our business that I think wouldn't have been there before. But it certainly puts the requirements of leadership in, in, in a different mode. 
because you now don't deal with people that you necessarily have a common background with. And you have to understand how to lead in an environment where you have such diversity. And almost every aspect of life now, we have a much more diverse uh, group of new lead, as, as I refer to them in, in my class. And these migrations have done all sorts of things, I think, to enhance societies, but also to bring into question identities, you know, impact on, on a sense of tribalism, and have created frictions as well as, as positive effects. But it is another thing into the mix of change in this new world order. We also have seen an increase in failed or incapable states around the world. Believe me, I spent the last 10 years of my life in places like Somalia and the Balkans and northern Iraq when the, the Kurds were chased out by Saddam. And in my time at CENTCOM where I had East Africa, Southwest Asia, the Middle East, I watched states that collapsed or were near collapse or were incapable and became sanctuaries for uh, uh, extremist groups where in order to survive they grow cocoa leaves or poppies, uh, warlords dominated, and all sorts of problems were generated from these societies that were failing or were incapable or near incapable. Their agricultural and, and industrial practices damaged the environment, their destruction of the rainforest, and you watch this, this, this really sad set of conditions that, were, that was growing more and more and had global impact. It was not local or, or just remote. We have also seen in the last two decades the rise of new powers. Brazil, a resurgent Russia, India, China, and many more. But there has been an alteration in terms of where the power is. Not necessarily reflected in places like the United Nations and the Security Council, which still has a post-World War II structure and identity. But there's been a shift. And no one fully understands the rise of these new powers and the implication and the relationships that exist and what it means going forward. I believe, arguably, that historians will look back at the beginning of the 21st century and this will be called the era of Islamic or Muslim transformation or transition. I really believe that the most significant thing that will happen in this period will be the Islamic world's transition and adjustment to modernity. And it's going to be a rocky patch, in my view. I spent the last 20 years mostly in this part of the world. And I think I understand it somewhat. It's going through a very difficult adjustment. It's going through a combination of, uh, of reformation, enlightenment, renaissance, uh, religious adjustment, uh, feeling the impacts of modernity, and the impacts of some of the things I mentioned all at once at probably the worst time in history. And I really believe you're going to see some elements of this society come through okay. Some are going to have a very difficult time and some might not make it. But it is going to have a global effect. Not long ago, a few years ago, I read a statistic in the papers that we had now crossed a line where more human beings lived in cities than they lived outside of cities in rural or remote areas. That may not seem like a, a, a fact of great importance, but to me, having seen some of these urban areas and cities, I think it is a sign of, of the kind of problems and instability that are going to be generated in cities that can't cope, that have all the problems of large cities without the institutions that deal with their environment. And this urbanization of, of uh, our, our humankind, I think, are going to have down the road more devastating impact as water supplies dry up, as the inability to, to effectively employ everybody that are in these cities, provide the basic services, we're going to see greater problems in these urban areas. The environment has suddenly become an issue. I, I participated in a study with 11 other retired generals and admirals on the security impact of climate change. And we took this on because the Center for Naval Analysis in Washington, D.C. said everybody is, is looking at climate change and looking at the impact, worst case, best case. Nobody is taking the next step and saying, what are the security implications of the effects of climate change? We looked at the science, and we sort of bracketed the science. We, we didn't want to take a position one way or another. We sort of looked at within the science, there's definitely something happening. 
there's definitely going to be effects of climate change. Is it a one degree Celsius or a three degree Celsius? When you walk through the impacts, that's a difference between tough to manage and hard times to catastrophe, as best I could sort out from the, from the scientists and what would happen. We could understand the impacts, land loss, climate change that affects uh, uh, health conditions, water resources drying up, seas that now become navigable that weren't before, like the Arctic. And then we had to do the analysis of the security implications. And it was deeply concerning because you see entire populations that will be left without water or without land. Entire zones that will change from temperate to tropical and, and have to cope with diseases and health issues it hadn't known before. A rush to maybe uh, mine the resources of the Arctic and what it might mean for the five nations, including the U.S., that face off against it. And do we have another competition and do we have a, 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 another possible confrontation in that area? There were many, many other things in the last two decades, beginning with that fall of the Soviet Union, that I observed. It affected me so much that two years ago I wrote a book about it. And I wrote the book not from the perspective of anyone analyzing all this, but someone reporting all this. You know, I come back as a, as, as a retired military officer, I come back as someone who's worked in, in, in most of the world on diplomatic missions. I come back from academia where I worked some programs where we established joint education systems uh, around the world. And I come back as a businessman involved in international business and marketing and business development. And I've seen these effects from these four sides. And I thought that we have seen a remarkable change in the world and we don't get it. I remember reading in Henry Kissinger's book about the reordering of the world five times in, 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 in modern times, three times in the last century. And it's an interesting study to look back at the last three reorderings. The first two came after a world war. And in the end of the first world war, President Wilson looked at the world and said, if we don't do something, if we don't get involved, if we don't have some impact on changing the conditions that led to this war, we're going to repeat this. It isn't going to sell water. And of course, he believed in, in his 14 points, the League of Nations, all the ideas he had about changes, removing the sources of the problem, colonialism, militarism, imperialism. And he did not get an audience or any reaction here. It devastated him. He had a Congress that was basically isolationist and a, po a population that was basically isolationist. After World War II, we had m one of the most remarkable periods in our history that gets little attention. We had a Democratic administration under President Truman and a Republican Congress that certainly there was no love lost between them. And you had President Truman, you had George Marshall as Secretary of State and others, that did an assessment of the world, this post-World War II world, and saw a changed and different world with new threats, new order, and a need to re-examine and prepare a strategy for dealing with it. They proposed the Marshall Plan, which had less than 19% popular support, the American people. Marshall gave 84 speeches to convince Americans it was the right thing to do. We had the formation and the joining of NATO, a military alliance, totally alien to anything in our past, totally contrary to the warnings of Jefferson and Washington about foreign entanglements and committing yourself to something, especially in Europe. We had the creation of the development banks, the IMF. We had the creation of the National Security Council, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the uh, uh, 1947 National Security Act, and this Republican Congress and this Democratic administration prepared a strategic vision for the future. We knew we had to contain and deter a rising Soviet Union and, and, and uh, 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 China that was communist. We knew we had to repair a Europe that was devastated and a Japan that was devastated. We knew we had to take a different approach in restructuring our own government to deal with this. And the efforts of the Marshalls and Kennans and Vandenbergs the efforts of our Congress and our President and the administration prepared us to deal with that period from then until that collapse I started to talk with. 
At the end of, of this period, because it didn't end with a bang, there wasn't this cataclysmic event of a world war. We didn't get it. And so all these things I mentioned, and I could mention another 10, slowly but surely co coalesced in some sort of perfect storm to produce a very changed world. And I would argue a world we don't get or understand yet. We are still operating as if we're back in that Cold War era in many, many respects. All the effects of this have developed a new generation, Generation Y, the millennial generation, that manifests you know, it, it, its reaction to all these changes in different ways depending on where you are. It has created a new form of instability that doesn't stay confined and localized. That instability ends up breeding problems that wash up on everybody's shores. That instability is the new threat. My definition of instability is when a society cannot cope with a hostile environment it finds itself in. That hostile environment can be man-made, natural, or whatever. It can't cope because it doesn't have the institutions. They either don't exist or they're incapable. And if you want to stabilize these societies, you need to build capacity and help repair or establish those institutions political, economic, security institutions, humanitarian institutions, capacity building and things like rule of law and the ability to tend and take care of itself, education systems. And this has now become the job of the entire world, especially the first world. It's not a matter of altruism. It's not a matter of feel good, do it out of choice. It's a matter of necessity. Sometimes when I talk about these things to sort of middle America, when I'm out talking to the food producers of the Midwest or whatever, I get a comment in the Q&A, hey, General, we better take care of things here first. We can't afford to be off doing, doing these sorts of things. My comment back is, tell me what concerns you. Well, it's drugs on my street. Well, who's growing the cocoa leaves and the poppies? Well, it's worried that there might be a terrorist attack. Well, where are the bases of operation in the sanctuaries in the world? Well, I'm worried about the environment. Well, who's cutting down the rainforest and belching fluorocarbons into the ozone layer somewhere in the world? You know, almost every worry you can trace back now into this shrunken world, or this flat world, as Thomas Friedman says, although my students say it's bumpy, it's not really flat. You know, that this world now has become so small, so interconnected, so interdependent, that you can't disregard instability generated in some remote area because it will grow it will metastasize in some way and eventually will have its impact and negative effects wash onto your shores in some way. And you can't build walls and you can't build and, and de uh, depend on mighty oceans to keep it away. You can't become self-dependent. You can't become protectionist and think it's going to keep it all away. You have to become engaged. If I were talking to the new president and he or she asked my opinion about what should be done in the first year of the presidency that sort of set the tone for dealing with this new world, I would give the following advice. First of all, make an assessment and try to truly understand this world. You know, I hear the terms that still take us back to a world that is long gone. You know, we talk in terms, in, in, in terms of Iraq of victory and defeat. It's not going to be victory or defeat as we've known it before. We still talk in terms that make people believe that we still live and breathe in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. It isn't that way. Assess this new world. Understand some of the changes, some of which I describe, but there are many more, that are making this an entirely new ordered world. Economically, politically, in security sense, and, and in almost every aspect of, of, of human endeavor. Second, revive the, 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 the importance of strategic design. You know, there's sort of a cry in Washington, where are the marshals? They aren't out there anymore, the George Marshals. We don't value strategic thinking and strategic planning. It used to be the cornerstone of what made us great. We understood our role in the world, our purpose in the world, our direction, our vision, and how to accomplish it. We become a soundbite society. We all have a collective attention deficit disorder. 
We, we watch a debate of presidential candidates, and the winner is deemed by who has the snappiest little soundbite or tomorrow's bumper sticker, as opposed to a really hard position. If a presidential candidate wanted three hours of prime time to give their strategic view of the world, we'd be on to American Idol that fast. There is no interest in strategic thinking, in, develop, in strategic vision, and developing strategic design or planning anymore. And therefore, if you don't know where you're going, anything will get you there. We sort of bounce around in incoherent fashion. We have no real policies, no real strategy. We one off everything. We deal with Iraq, we deal with the Middle East peace process, we deal with Afghanistan in some sort of manner that, that makes you think that these are all isolated in incidents, that these things are not connected in some way. We don't have regional strategies, we don't have global strategies. We produce a national security strategy that's a salute to motherhood. It doesn't set priorities, it doesn't allocate resources, it doesn't give direction. It doesn't allow for the development of programs that would help prevent some of the instability and problems we face. It's a statement of values. Sure, it's plenty noble to state your values and what's important, but and then what? What does it mean? The next thing I would advise the president is to try to solve these problems before they become crisis. You know, we don't want to invest in engagement and development. We don't want to take preventative steps. Foreign aid is a curse helping uh, societies that are beginning to collapse or move into instability and worse yet, erupt into crisis. We want to wait until the crisis is fully erupted. And then what do we do? We throw the United States military at it. You know, and that's all we know how to do. And so our military have become nation builders, reconstructionists, humanitarians, peacekeepers, everything they were trained not to be. You know, and, and, and they do the best they can because nobody else is around to pick up those sorts of pieces. My son just came back from Iraq a week ago, the year before he was in Afghanistan. I said to my son, what's the most significant thing you did? He's an infantry officer in the Marine Corps. He said, well, we reopened and rehabilitated an oil refinery. Well, that's pretty interesting for an infantry battalion, certainly skills as an infantry officer I didn't have. And he's talking about his interaction with the, with the locals in Haditha in Ambar province and everything that went on. He made no mention in a five and a half hour drive of any military action. Everything he talked about, that was sort of an aside, had to do with interacting with the people, economic reconstruction, the political situation on the ground, the cultural differences. At the end, I asked him before we got out of the car, what is it that you needed most that you didn't have when you went there? He said, I wish I would have had a better understanding of the culture why they do what they do, why they think the way they think, why the situation is what it is. He felt more than equipped to, do, to, to conduct his military role. He didn't feel equipped to conduct this other role, political, economic, social interaction, humanitarian interaction, that he was forced to do on the ground. I mean, before that, he was in Afghanistan and faced basically the same thing. And so we need to build the programs that are much less costly in human capital and in treasure that prevent these things rather than waiting for the catastrophe to occur. We need to think more in that strategic design before we get engaged. We, need, we can't take this simplistic, hard power approach to everything. I co-chair a council of 52 retired generals and admirals. 44 of us are four stars. And our council is lobbying the Congress to fund the other elements of power beside the military on an equal basis. Where are the diplomats? Where are the political reconstructionists? Where are the economic reconstructionists? Where are those that are going to do the humanitarian work, build the capacity needed on the ground for rule of law, governance, or whatever? You know, and what we have failed to do we have failed our own soldiers because we leave them high and dry without some counterpart to be able to do the things that will stabilize a society. You know, uh, Dave Petraeus said, there is no military solution in Iraq. Of course there's no military solution. The military can buy you time, it can provide security, and then what? To do what? We never effectively answered that question. 
It was pathetic what the Coalition Provisional Authority under Bremer and the CPA and its predecessor did in Iraq. Woefully inexperienced, unprepared, lack of planning, and engaging in trying to build a society that had no concept of the cultural background to that society and an understanding of the situation. Maybe if we'd had that understanding in the beginning, we would have understood the complexity of this intervention and chose to do something else. We need to rebuild relationships, Mr. and Ms. Pre Ms. President, relationships around the world that are severely damaged. I believe the new president is going to have an advantage because I think there will be a honeymoon period. And I think you will see a rush to the door of the new president to say, we want you back, buddy. Not back in the way we've had for the last eight years, but we want you back, we want America back in a positive way, in a constructive way. We want you engaged, we want you leading, we want you participating, but we need you back. We can't do without you, and we can't have you continue the way you're going. We need to build new partnerships in the world. You know, there are strange new entities out there that we deal with, non-governmental organizations, private volunteer organizations, regional and sub-regional political entities. We need to be merging these together. We need to be working as partners to deal with issues around the world as we confront these factors of instability in these societies that are unstable. We need to be the catalysts to help re-energize institutions like the United Nations that need reform and change and, and modernization, but can be effective if they're brought up uh, to deal with what we face in the 21st century. We need to build coalitions. Coalitions not only to deal with security problems, but environmental problems, social problems, political issues, developmental problems, the building of capacity around the world in these places that are unstable. We need to have a serious conversation with the American people. We need to get away from things like politicizing the environment. Could you imagine that it's a Democrat or Republican issue, whether the, we're going to have climate change or not? My humble educational background, I kind of thought it might have been a scientific issue and not a political issue. I didn't know it was an issue of being conservative and liberal uh, as to whether you understand the effects of nature and climate. We managed to politicize everything. You know, and we got to get away from this red and blue mentality. More importantly, the bully pulpit of the presidency has to be used to educate the American people that they don't live in the beginning of the 20th century. You live in a shrunken world that's interdependent. You can no longer isolate yourself from that world. You have to engage in it. And some little damn thing in the Balkans is going to affect you and blow up. And it is necessary to have that appreciation and understanding of that engagement. Prior to the intervention in, the Iraq, in Iraq, three weeks before the war, I testified before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. I told the committee that there was no imminent threat from Iraq. I told the committee that in my view, and looking how we're going to go about this military intervention, it was going to be a disaster. I told them that you could find a situation that's worse than a contained Saddam, which they found hard to believe. I had one senator say to me, General, what's the difference? As long as we go in and take out Saddam, what could be worse? I said, well, Senator, remember when we went into Afghanistan the first time and we successfully caused the defeat of the Soviet Union and they withdrew? And we thought this was a wonderful achievement. We left. And we, le we then had the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. And we had 500,000 refugees in Pakistan, which helped destabilize it. Now tell me what was worse. And you're going to face the same thing in Iraq. The other point I would like to make to you, Senator, is we don't come home anymore. We still have this naive belief that it's the American Expeditionary Force under good old Blackjack Pershing that goes over there, does its thing, and comes back. We haven't come back since the end of World War II. We don't come back. Why do you think we have military structures called Central Command, Southern Command, Northern Command, European Command, African Command, Pacific Command? When you make the mess, or to use the metaphor that Colin Powell did, when you break the pottery, you own it. When you touch it, you own it. You aren't coming home. You're not coming back. Whatever you lay down and put down on the ground will be yours. You can't escape it now. And so be careful how you touch it. 
I understand Pottery Barn. I have a grandson that's banned from every Pottery Barn in the United States. You know, and we need to not apply our foreign policy and our intervention on the same basis. Part of that informing of the American people needs to be convincing them of this recognition of the interdependence of the world today in almost every aspect. It is the same kind of education process that George Marshall did in trying to convince the American people to reach deep in their pockets and fund the rehabilitation of their former enemies, hot on the end of a world war. And yet, leadership was able to accomplish that. We should also, Mr. President, transform our military. We've been promising to do this since the 2000 election. We've been promising to do this and made our first promises back after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And we've never successfully transformed our military into the kind of military we need now. It is still a rump of a Cold War military. You could bring back Black Jack Pershing and he would recognize this military. Maybe the guns shoot further and the planes fly faster, but he'll basically understand it. It is not the kind of military we need for the 21st century. We do not have the same kind of State Department, USAID, Department of Commerce, and other agencies that are geared for this, this uh, new century. We've got to change government the way the 1947 National Security Act did. We have bloated bureaucracy in Washington. When we have a problem, our solution to the problem is to create more bloated bureaucracy. 9-11, we find out 16 intelligence agencies can't talk to each other. What do we do? We create a 17th, the National Intelligence Directorate. We find out Homeland Security is insufficient. What do we do? We create the Department of Homeland Security. And we see the performance of FEMA. They're doing a heck of a job, Brownie, down here in Katrina. We have a system of patronage where competence isn't rewarded, political loyalty and support is rewarded. So eight of the top 12 FEMA officials have no experience in disaster re relief or disaster assistance. Brownie was running an Arabian Horse Association in Colorado before he got the job. Excellent credentials, you know, to run FEMA. We have a system of earmarks that's ridiculous. We fund a study on the mating habits of the sea otter or build bridges to nowhere. So, you know, we have bloated structure that can't react, isn't streamlined, isn't responsive to the needs that we face today. We have a system of rewarding not competence, but political loyalty, which puts us in a position where we don't have the most competent in the positions we need them. And we have a system of earmarks that wastes our resources that could be obviously used for better purposes. And so, Mr. President, I would say that in your first year in office, you need to take a hard look at this world. I'm reporting to you as someone for the last almost 20 years has seen the world from the front lines, from the foxhole. I can't fully interpret this. I know one thing. All the think tanks in this town of Washington that give you one-page papers and strategies for solutions are useless. You need to understand this world and its complexity. And you need to develop a strategic vision and view. You need to structure this government. You need to appoint and assign people and ensure, along with the Congress that confirms them, that we have the most competent people in the world that can work this. And you need to build the relationships and connections that this world needs now because it is so small and interdependent. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's uh, interesting as a side note that uh, Admiral William Fallon has just been pushed out of uh, your old command because he tried to put the brakes on the uh, continued death and destruction bombing Iran and uh, their nuclear facilities, which would cause a bigger military uh, conflagration over there as well as a humanitarian with nuclear uh, pollution over that entire area for thousands of years. 
But uh, I'd like to talk about a little bit other New World Order, as Bill Still in his book, The New World Order, Secret Plans, Oh, Ancient Plans of Secret Societies. This goes back a long time, and it's not about humanitarianism. It's about complete control and causing the problems and offering their solutions. Now you've got different stables in the arena vying for the top position. Adolf Hitler, an occultist, secret society, funded by Wall Street. He was for the New World Order, but it was for his control and his secret society that he wanted around the world. The Soviet Union, which was also funded by Wall Street, was for the New World Order. Stalin was for the New World Order. You have a question? Yes. Would you talk about that New World Order and where they're taking us, if you know? It's there for you to find if you really want to look at it, and it's not anything about what you're talking about. They create the problems and offer their solution. Order out of chaos, and it ain't pretty, and it's not nice. I hope you look into that. And hopefully Admiral Fallon will be replaced by someone who is as either uh, savvy militarily as you and he were, or a humanitarian that doesn't want to see more death and destruction of our men, money, and material, and the people in the rest of the world. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we'll take several questions. Maybe we'll take several questions if any uh, All at once. Uh, Go ahead. Oh, sure. <clears throat> Hi, thanks for coming. Um, I have just two quicker questions that I've been really eager to ask someone with your background and level of experience in the military. Um, the first one is, I'm really interested in your views on this really childish and kind of historically ignorant argument that we all seem to get in every time the civilian leadership of this country recommends military action somewhere. Um, anytime anyone seems to speak up and say that maybe we should slow down or consider something else than military action than sending our troops off to uh, invade or occupy a nation, anyone that speaks up really gets kind of pigeonholed into this idea of being anti-American. They hate this country, they hate the troops, they want them to die, and I really resent that, and it's very frustrating. It seems to go against, first of all, the idea that this nation exists because we disobeyed authority because of that notion that sometimes the leadership is wrong. And, and there, you know, you've mentioned the Bay of Pigs invasion and you mentioned Vietnam when you were talking about Iraq. We have precedence for the fact that they're not always good at their decisions. And I guess what I'm asking is, what is the real view of the military about that? I mean, how do people in the military really view it when, when progressive people like in this town, who are some of the people that I know that speak up the most in defense of the troops, when we get just kind of framed as these people that hate this country. Second question. Sorry, I'll make it quick. I need someone to explain to me real quickly, if you can, the logic with Iraq. Now, people argue about um, whether or not they really believe WMDs were there. And so let's just assume that they believe they were. I don't know much about military strategy, but from what I've read about WMDs, they, in a lot of ways they serve first as a deterrent and often as a, as a possible weapon of last resort. Right, if you have nothing left, and maybe you use that. If that's true, and they had an army which had no chance against ours, and most armies don't, what is the logic in sending our troops in? If we argued that the man was crazy enough to use them against his own people, wouldn't that make sense that he would, of course, use them against us? So. Okay. Well, uh, let me give you my perspective as someone who has served 40 years in the military. When I was... Um, when I, was, uh, uh, when I first joined the military, I rose my right hand and swore to defend the Constitution of the United States of America. I didn't swear an allegiance to an individual, not a king or a president, to the Constitution. Under that Constitution, I swore to defend your right, freedom of speech. And if you don't exercise that right, you're letting me down, regardless of what your views are. So from my perspective, and, and my friends that have served in the military with me, uh, you have the right to speak out. You would, you would be disappointing us if we are sacrificing to protect that right if you didn't exercise it. First question, okay? Uh, the second question about Iraq WMD. I actually did work for the Central Intelligence Agency on Iraq intelligence right up to the day of the war. I can tell you I saw the intelligence. I can tell you there was no threat from WMD. I can tell you I testified to that effect three weeks before the war. 
Senator Luger asked me if there was an imminent threat in the public hearing, and I said there is not, you know, in my assessment. And uh, I don't believe the intervention in Iraq had anything to do with WMD as a threat. I honestly believe, and this is my opinion now, I, I, I don't have any inside knowledge of this, but I honestly believe that we had an administration that was jolted, shocked, traumatized by 9-11. I think that the obvious going into Afghanistan and chasing Al-Qaeda, you know, that was a given. I think that they were looking for something more dramatic to do, a sense that we are extremely vulnerable, a sense that it, the attack could happen again. We were totally surprised by this. Uh, we didn't understand the scope of the problem. And I think without a strategy and an understanding of the region, when you had a, a certain groups that came forward and said, we have an idea, that if you take down a regime like Saddam's, you have the possibility of igniting the fires of democracy, which will sweep across the region. Now, if you don't know the region, if you don't understand the military and, and, and war fighting, if you have no concept of, of the culture you're dealing with, that may sound like a wonderful siren song played out of the neocon uh, you know, think tanks in Washington. And I think, unfortunately, the senior leadership and the administration bit on it, on it, despite a number of us saying it isn't going to be that way. First of all, this is not a threat. You're losing focus on what's important. Second of all, you're going to unleash hell when you go in there. It's not going to be a liberation, flowers in the street, cakewalk. It's going to be a disaster because you're doing with too few troops, lack of understanding uh, of what you're going to find in there in a fragile society that is so broken that you're going to see ethnic and religious rivalries, things pour across that border, things rise up from inside that are going to cause you to have the problems that you've had. And we said those things. But I honestly believe, really and truly, it had nothing to do with WMD, in, in, in all honesty. Yeah. Um, I want to thank you very much for your speech. I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, one quick thought, and then the question is, um, I don't own a cell phone. And uh, I really appreciated what you said about cell phones and laptops. I know this is a very intellectual community here on campus, but don't be afraid not to open your cell phone amongst the crowd that does, because for me, this is what, what's happening in the world is very symbolic of the breakdown of the world. This is not a healthy thing we're doing in the wireless technology. We don't know what effects it has. Anyway, um, I would love to sit down and talk to you for a long time, because I'm very impressed by you. Uh, no, I mean that. As a general, Thank coming you. here and, and saying what you said today really impressed me. Um, the question is, um, this administration is very criminal, and you've been very kind in your last words uh, about them, but I think they knew what they were doing, and they created a mess, um, such a mess that has created more terrorism and destabilization in the world, and not only in Iraq, but with the relations with other countries. So my question is, how are we going to turn this around, and will you advise the next president? Because I think you have a lot of words of wisdom, and um, how are we going to get out of Iraq? Uh, your, your, your knowledge of how we can get out of Iraq um, Okay. Anything else you want to add? Well, I, I think my view, regardless of who's president, you will see us uh, change our involvement in Iraq. I didn't say withdrawal, but I don't want to imply there's going to be combat troops patrolling the streets of Baghdad because I don't think American people would support that, and I think we're beyond that point anyway. I think that we have certain obligations, regardless of whether you change administrations. I want to say one thing before I finish the answer to this question. I travel around the world a lot, and I talk to many of the leaders in the world, many of the, uh, uh, of the people that, that, that are powerful. In my last set of travels, in the last few months, I've heard something I've never heard before. I heard people doubting the ability of the United States to get things done, to manage things, to manage it successfully. I never heard that before. As a matter of fact, when I was at CENTCOM and when I traveled around the world in any region, 
you had to convince people that America wasn't omnipotent, that we could do everything. You had to say, no, no, we're not that good. You know, oh, you could do anything, you Americans. Now they begin to wonder and doubt. The second thing that bothers me and resonates is our enemies are saying Americans won't stick to it. Americans are not good allies. Uh, look at Vietnam. Look at Beirut. Look at uh, Somalia. Look at uh, uh, Yemen and the coal bombing. They've never had a ship back in the port, despite other ships from navies around the world go in there. Look at the Kobar Towers bombing in, in the eastern provinces of Saudi Arabia. They ran away from Saudi Arabia. You know, and they go through this litany of events where we got our nose bloodied and we cut out and, and quit. Uh, and they, they have, I'm, I'm speaking as they would describe it. And they're saying, now look at Iraq. They caused this mess, and now the clamor is to leave and get out. And it doesn't matter if it's a, a, a hard-line conservative government. Ronald Reagan pulled out of Beirut. Nixon pulled out of Vietnam. You know, and it doesn't matter if it's a liberal democratic administration. Clinton pulled out of, of uh, Somalia and, and the eastern provinces of Saudi Arabia and the port of Aden in Yemen. You know, so it, it doesn't matter. It's in their nature. They will let you down. And they'll use this excuse. That was the last administration. This is a new administration. I don't owe anything. I have no obligation as an American to what happened to Iraq. And that bothers me a little bit. I was opposed to the Iraq intervention. I thought it was the wrong war, wrong place, wrong time. I certainly thought the military way we were doing this was dead wrong from 40 years of experience. But I will tell you, we Americans made this mess. And we don't know how to clean it up. I would now ensure that we continue the security assistance to the Iraqi security forces. We owe them that. Training, education, the material that they need to provide the security as best they can. They're going to have a rough road ahead. I would ensure that we help with economic development. I would have our president go, uh, talk to those in the region now with a new face on the presidency saying, we need to come together. This is not only our problem, it's your problem in the region. If this becomes a sanctuary for extremists, if a religious war between Shia and Sunni, you know, Persian and Arab erupt, it will impact the entire region. We need to come together now. We need to consult together which will be refreshing for them instead of being told what to do or brushed aside. And as I said before, the new president, I think, is going to have people that want to see the leadership and the engagement. The worst thing we can do is say, another disaster or mistake. We've had Democrats have disasters and mistakes, beginning with Vietnam, and we have had Republicans have disasters and mistakes. This isn't a political issue of liberal and conservative. This is an issue of what we stand for. We cannot continue to be involved in Iraq in the way we are now. That's a given. We can, because it is not effective, it is tremendously expensive, both in, in human lives and in, in treasure. We need to change it, but I will tell you this. We cannot continue to abandon commitments, to let down allies. We cannot continue to do what we did in Afghanistan the first time around. Yeah, we came in, we gave Stinger missiles to all the uh, Afghan guerrillas, we knocked down Soviet helicopters, we caused them to have their Vietnam in retreat, and then we walked away and left hundreds of thousands of refugees, a dismantled and disassembled Afghanistan, ripe for the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and, and other extremists to take over this, this unstable society that we generated and caused. And I'm saying that I understand your passion. Look, my son has been in Afghanistan, my son has been Iraq, and I've sweated and worried about him where, where he's been. I've been shot and wounded three times. I understand what it's all about. But I'll tell you one thing, we've got to decide what we stand for. We cannot continue going around the world making a mess and then internally agonizing over it and leaving it you know, based on some noble principle that it's not done on our watch. And therefore, we have no obligation, and we're better than that. We do it in the name of our country, like it or not, whether you voted for the last guy or not. And we have an obligation to fix it. I hope you heard my speech about changing the, our approaches, about fixing what we have done, and about engaging in a different way. 
Again, you can't run away and lock your doors. You can't build that wall across the Canadian and Mexican borders. You can't defend a shoreline, two shorelines that are massive and long. You can't become self-sufficient in energy. You can't put restrictions on trade, you know, and have a Buy America policy and nobody else is allowed in and you can't invest in our country. You can't have a, a, a way of getting access to resources on your terms only without a level playing field. This is the message I'm taking you from seeing the world out there. It's not a political statement in any way. It just reflects the reality I saw. And so we are going to have to live with Iraq. I would say that I think we can live with an Iraq in a different way, without the casualties and the costs and the treasure. But it's going to take monumental work, a tremendous amount of leadership, and a tremendous amount of, uh, uh, of cooperation and partnership building by the next president. Thank you. Um, I had a quick question. You said you would not get involved in politics in the past. Has that changed? No. And okay. Even if you were shortlisted, say for potential. No, no that's okay. a rumor. No. Okay. There's no All truth right. to that. I believe that. Okay. Um, could I have uh, one specific example of a type of reengagement you would suggest to a new president uh, getting reinvolved in Kyoto or emissions controls uh, internationally? Some gesture that would speak to America's getting uh, back involved with things? Could you mention one? Yeah, thing? I, I, I think you picked a good one. I think it's a serious cooperation on the environment. I think we're past the, uh, at least most sane people to, uh, to understanding there is a threat uh, and it's coming faster than we may have imagined. I think where we have the most unstable parts of the world, let's say the Middle East, where, where we build the partnerships. You know, we had, here's the interesting thing to me, because I served as U.S. Central Command. We have had treaty arrangements and security alliances and collective ag agreements for Europe, for Southeast Asia, for almost every place in the world. The most volatile part of the world, we have no security arrangement. You know, and, and we have dictated the security in this part of the world since the Brits left in 1971. So it might be time to look at some sort of security arrangement, some sort of collective application. It certainly would be more in line with our ability to share the burden and have a more cooperative effort in how we do it, instead of unilaterally taking it on. So that's the second thing I would do, is look at building the kinds of collective security arrangements in the regions that are most threatened. You know, I, I think we need to renew old partnerships. You know, NATO is in danger. It's at a defining moment in Afghanistan if it can't stand up to this challenge. We need to re-energize NATO. We need to reform and change and help develop a UN that's responsive, you know, to the needs of the world. Even in our own hemisphere, you know, which we neglect and, and unfortunately, you know, bear the consequences of what happens. We need to build the relationships. We need to have an understanding about economic partnerships and relationships. We can't decide about trade agreements or anything else and understand the impact. Very few of us, even economists, uh, have a hard time uh, explaining and understanding the advantages and disadvantages to trade agreements and, uh, and, and how these things might work. Uh, you know, so, so the American people are subject to whatever political whim or, or, or uh, uh, some sort of spin that can be put on this. So, I, you know, I, there are many, many things, and much of it beyond my skill and my uh, understanding and intellect to, to do, but it can't be business as usual. I'd like to ask you to follow up, if you will, on your comments that you see a transformation coming into the Islamic world. Let me put my question in context. Mm -hmm. As a Muslim Arab American, mm -hmm. and as an educator who's been working with Muslims and Arabs for the last 40 years, right. I just came back from Syria, Jordan, and France on a research trip. And the most opinion has been, or the majority of the opinion, is that very, very lack of hope that there will be any positive change. And people are going even further negatively with the tra religious transformation. So would you please give us a more positive light on that? <laughs> yeah, yes, you know, I, it depends. You obviously look at it now 
And you will see, you can certainly see the glass is the empty part of the glass. Or you can look down and see parts of the glass that are becoming more full. You know, I see signs, hopeful signs in this part of the world. I, I don't want to be, you know, Pollyannish about this or overly optimistic. But I see the role of women changing in some parts of this world. The ambassador from Oman to the United States is a woman. You know, uh, the, the, the finance minister of the United Arab Emirates is a woman. And I see in some places where parliaments have been created and some of the, the authority from the emir or the king has been passed to the parliament. Uh, women have the right to vote and run for office. I always tell my American friends, how many American women have been president of the United States? How many Muslim women have been head of state? Can you answer that? No. Uh, I can name five. None. Go back and do your homework and figure it out. None. Who had the, None who had, from Islamic State point of view. I, I must tell Well, I would say that, Indonesia, please. Turkey, Sri Lanka, uh, Pakistan, they, they had uh, uh, women that, that uh, and, and who had the right to vote first, Muslim women or American women? Go to Azerbaijan and you'll find out they had the right to vote before American women. So to say the society inherently has something about it, culturally, religiously, that makes it unable to adapt or change or morph. Not, I didn't say it would be easy. I said it's going to be, and some, and some uh, societies in the Muslim world will have a more difficult time. I do not think it's impossible. I think it's an issue of education. It's an issue of global cooperation and work and patience on this. You know, and, and I think the reforms will come and the changes will come. The society needs to help itself more because you have a very uneven Muslim society. You have tremendously wealthy Muslim societies in, in the Gulf and tremendously poor elsewhere. There needs to be some sort of collective view in, in how, how to get there. It is not a religion, as you know better than I, that has some sort of central uh, a view of, of, of establishing doctrine. You know, it is a decentralized religion by nature. And so it has difficulty establishing itself. There isn't a Vatican. You know, there, there isn't a council of bishops. And so it's, it's much more difficult for this transformation. The views of the religion vary. You know, and, 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 and there's degrees of secularism and there's degrees of fundamentalism that not necessarily put everybody in a, in a violent end of it in some ways. I said that this first half of this century will be the era of Islamic transformation. I didn't make real predictions about it other than I said, I see some societies within the Muslim world that actually come through this pretty well. And others will have a lot of trouble getting through it. Uh, I don't have a formula. You know, uh, the Pope didn't give me one in my religious beliefs, you know, and, 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 and how to handle this. He probably added to the problem, you know, but... Uh, Definitely. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks, General, for coming. Um, I myself, I served in the U.S. Army um, for four years. I was with the 10th Mountain Division up at Fort Drum. Mm -hmm. um, served as an infantryman in Iraq. Um, first of all, I would say you talked a lot about the um, transformation of the Arab world, and like from what I've seen from my personal experience um, under with Iraq under U.S. occupation. Um, first of all, when I was there, um, Iraqis had power for maybe two hours a day. I was in the cities of Abu Ghraib, and I was right outside of Fallujah, and um, you know, there was no real sewage system for the people of Iraq. And none of that, and I think the most disheartening thing for me coming home was that none of that changed from the beginning when we were told that we were going there to help the Iraqi people in 2005. And none of that really changed by the time we got home. Um, so first of all, I would just like to thank you for, for what you said um, before the war started, and I wish more people would have listened. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, you are right that, that, Iraq, that Iraq is not going successfully right now. We've seen with the rise of al-Sadr what's happening in Basra, um, that Iraqis are very angry at the, at the uh, um, under occupation and they're, the, that they're willing to fight back even, you know, five years into occupation. And I think, like, the way that I feel as a veteran, I feel like the best way to, to um, support the troops is to bring them home and give them the care that they need. Um, so tonight at 7 o'clock over at um, Lewis Auditorium and Goldwyn Smith Building, we're going to be having a Winter, winter Soldier Tribunal. Um, and my, my question was, I just wanted to, well, it wasn't really a question, but I wanted... <laughs> I wanted, to, I wanted to invite you, General, to come, to come see our testimony as boots on the ground, as, as young enlisted soldiers and NCOs, um, to come see what our story is and, and understand where we're coming from. So I'd like to invite you to that. Sure. Yeah, I'd be glad to. You know, I, I want to go back to my son. I asked him, I said, what's it all, in your view, what's it all about on the ground, where obviously you experience where the boots are? Uh, he said it's about 
tribes, power, guns, money, and jobs. You have to address those five elements. Now, listen to that voice from the ground and what you just heard, and then listen to the policymakers and their views in their sort of exalted view of, uh, you know, in trying to measure the progress on democracy and, and, and establishing free market economy. You know, economies, it, there's some sort of hierarchy of needs here that you have to get down and deal with and structure. The idea that you go into a society that has become so fractured and fragmented and your emphasis is on dipping your finger in a bottle of ink and claiming democracy is ridiculous when they don't have a job and they don't know where the next meal comes from and the power isn't on and the water's polluted and they can't send their kids to school for fear, fear of being shot. You know, Jeffersonian democracy is kind of out there, maybe a little priority number 38 somewhere in that sort of list. And that's where we get it wrong. It's not dealing with basic needs first, building confidence and trust, and then building toward maybe a fundamentally representative government and, and down the road a long way off because it's a very sophisticated process. You might reach something that looks like democracy, but that's years, maybe decades away before it can happen. And it's this, this sort of naivete from Washington of not understanding what you just heard from this veteran from the 10th Mountain Division, you know, about what it's like on the ground where he's saying the people in front of me need basic security, basic services, need basic confidence in what's going on. And if you want to build this from the bottom up, you have to address those issues. Baghdad is about as relevant to Ambar province as Washington is to uh, East Cupcake, Montana, you know, and, and, and less probably. You know? And so we can't judge progress by what goes on in Baghdad and what leaders tell us that are trying to do something that's noble, you know, that's, that, that, that's abstract and has no real impact on the people on the ground. Yes. First of all, General, I'd like to thank you for uh, both your service to this country and coming to talk to us. Uh, my question is a bit more specific. Um, uh, after World War II, um, one could argue that it was easier for Americans to, to pick up the burden of being the global hegemon because we were entering a period of um, previously unseen and not, and not seen since uh, economic growth and prosperity and th the dollar was the currency of freedom around the world basically and we are entering into a very different time. The dollar is decreasing in popularity. Uh, we are in a recession right now. Uh, John McCain has you know, admitted himself and uh, I was wondering uh, if you could quickly, how would you address the average American from a fiscal perspective that you know we do need to, you know, put out these little fires in different regions of the world before they erupt in, into conflict, because it does seem like economically the realities are very different now than they were compared to at the end of World War II. Well, I would say a couple of things. This intervention, waiting until the crisis erupts, costs you billions and trillions of dollars. If you, want to, if you, if you say you can't afford the hundreds of thousands to the millions, single-digit millions of dollars, in engagement in development programs to prevent this, and you want to wait to the hundreds of billions and trillion dollars, well, it, you know, that's like saying, I'm not going to buy flood insurance even though I live in a floodplain. I'll let the waters come because I can't afford the flood insurance. Really? Then how can you afford the crisis? You know, for the amount of money we spent in Iraq, we could have owned that country. Saddam could have been sunbathing on the Riviera somewhere in exile, and we could have owned that country, bought it, and, everybody, and if you spread the money out amongst the population, they'd have all been wealthy enough uh, to exist. Right. And beside that, look at how we spend our own money. I mean, I, I talked about earmarks and the way spending is done here. Are we truly allocating the resources in a way that best meet our needs, that best meet the needs that, that, that we think ensure our security, ensure our prosperity, you know, that are in the best interest of what we want to promote around the world? I said that that's what I would tell this president that, that he or she needs to, to, to examine. It's easy to say we can't afford it until you look at the things we seem to be able to afford, you know, which to me seem to be much more wasteful. And, and the point I made about investing in preventive measures, which are much more cheap down the road than, than waiting for the crisis and then investing in a very expensive tool, the U.S. military, and in a, a very expensive kind of mission in reconstructing failed and totally collapsed societies. When maybe it, the preventive way would have been to help patch up or support or establish some institutions when you began to see the cracks. 
You know, so I, I think it's an issue of, uh, of taking a broader look at our resources and how they're allocated and applied. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, General, uh, thank you for your service. Yes, sir. I wanted to mention I've been in 36 countries speaking around the world. I've been around the horn. And I remember what Wilson said about militarism and what Dwight Eisenhower said about the military-industrial complex. And if I were speaking to that president, elect, I would say, President, there's a country in the world that has 737 military bases in foreign countries, in 142 foreign countries. That has to be eliminated. Mm -hmm. Step number one, take the money that's saved from that, because that's the United States. $450 billion, leave $150 billion for our defense, use that $450 billion to build nuclear reactors, and windmills, and in 10 years, we would be totally energy independent. No problem. We're just dissing the money away. Okay. Good afternoon, General. Thank you for coming. I'm a gold Thank star you. sister myself, although my brother died stateside. Um, I'd like to, to ask you and follow up on some other questions. Um, you indicated in your comments that I recently read your article, uh, uh, your interview with Mother Jones Magazine. When you were asked earlier about how we could get out of Iraq, you uh, suggested very strongly that it's not going to be possible, as you did in this article. You said we were going to have to stay there and finish, finish our commitment, complete our commitment. And today you've spoken about the civil and administrative and governmental aspects of that, especially the military. In this article, you also pointed out how you, people, the citizens of this country can't rely on experts. The citizens of this country have to remain informed about the, the international issues and the crises that right. we're confronted with and have to take responsibility ourselves for directing our country and our policy. How can we do that when our government lies to us? And is that not being lied to in a matter of war? Why would that not be a high crime and misdemeanor? Well, you know, I, I would say to you, it, I get a question almost every time I speak about what can we do, mm -hmm. we meaning the people. Well, first of all, and you hit on part of it, be better informed. Do you think we're, you, you think as a society we're as informed about this no, world as My we should be? My question is, how can we be as informed as we should be and be as confident about our it, information it, when our government lies to it us affirmatively? It, you know, your sources of information are beyond just your government, whether they're lying or well, not. If you be. say that, that sounds like something out of some sort of authoritarian regime, that the only information I get is from my government. My God, in this day and age, I just described all these electronic, you know, the Internet and, 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 you know, my students, when we were, when the Iraq War was starting, my students, William and Mary, were, were, because it was a class on international relations, were following the war. They wanted to know how to follow the war. I said, here's what I want you to do. Pick a, a U.S. cable network, Fox, CNN, MSNBC, whatever. Pick a newspaper, New York Times, Washington Post, whatever it is, prominent national newspaper. Then I want you to, to listen to BBC. I want you to read The Economist and The Financial Times. Then every night, I want you to go online and download English language Arab newspapers and read their editorial pages where it relates to the war in Iraq. They came back to me and said, which war is it? There's three wars out there, or four wars, or five wars. You know, and I said, but you're in, I don't know which war it is. I don't know who's right or wrong. I don't know who's shading the truth, spinning it, telling you a lie or is accurate. But I'm telling you the information is out there. And are you energized enough to go after it? How do you know your government's lying to you unless you go out and seek the truth? Well, I, I and in this day and age, the truth is, the truth is out there. Some, you, know, it, 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 you cannot keep things a secret. You cannot. I mean, your government could have told you it found WMD. Well, do you think did. that would have lasted very long? You know, I mean, to say that my government's my only source of information and it's lying, you know, presupposes that that's your only source of no, information. I, I would say that shouldn't be. only source of information. I was on the border of Hungary and read a Soviet publication in English, and I couldn't tell the difference between the Soviet publication talking about the Cold War and villainizing the United States versus the United States doing the same thing with the Soviet Union. They sounded much the same well, to me. You know, I, I, you know the, our, our media isn't perfect. But, but we live I in a representative democracy, sir, and I'm asking, how do we cope with the situation where, despite... Vote them out! As 
Why not? I mean, that's what's okay. great well, about our country. And then you know, as a vote them out. You said that you didn't believe that they went into Iraq as a result of weapons of mass destruction, but rather that as a result of 9-11, they were a little bit shocked. And, and they. And that's my view. I was no, asking no, my I view. To ask I, don't, about, I, don't, I, don't, I have no way no, of proving that. You said that. that there were people who came to them and suggested that an invasion would result in uh, you know, people coming in, more democracy. Mm -hmm. I, you may have been referring to the character Chalabi. And I wanted to ask you to what extent uh, we went into, and you also said in this article I read that, Iraq was already contained before yes. we went. So what was the point in going in there? To what extent did we go into Iraq to contain Iran? And to what extent did the misleading guidance we got from Chalabi uh, influence that decision and maybe lead to a wrong decision? Well, I think it's obvious that Chalabi was, was a con artist. Mm -hmm. And I think it's obviously the sources that he provided on the information were, were catering to an agenda that he had. Uh, I also think that, sure, the intervention in Iraq was to counter Iranian hegemony and, and this sort of naive belief that democracy was going to spring up and it was going to change the uh, character of the Middle East. Naive, you know, uh, uh, and, and not founded on, on understanding and the depth of understanding and, and the appreciation for the complexity of the environment, you know, and, and our government was guilty of that. And we have the privilege of removing them if, if we don't like it. You know, and, and that's our alternative. But we also have the, a remarkable world today that brings us information from all over. Mm -hmm. I really believe we have a remarkable media. I get upset with it. You know, there's, there's media that's on the left, there's media on the right, there's media that panders to the government, there's media that's against the government no matter what. But, you know, there is, there, this isn't a state-owned media. Far from it. And we have every brand, every flavor that we want. I think that, that that's great. I, I find that our media in the United States is the best, most disciplined, uh, despite all the flaws it may have. It, it, it has the highest uh, degree of self-policing that I see in any media around the world, you know, even in other developed countries. So, you know, it's not perfect, but the information is there if we want it.